and we're live. Dylan, thank you uh, so much for, for taking the time today, coming on the show. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to have you. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for having me. So I told you a few seconds ago, if there's a little tidbit, a little story, um, you know, you've done a bunch of press, a lot of media. Uh, I'm sure things are crazy these days, but if there's a little tidbit, a little story that the world doesn't know about Dylan Passage. Um, I mean, you know, at 24, nobody expects to have gone and still be going through the things that I've, you know, had to, to, to deal with. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely been an intense ride and it has not been easy. And, um, you know, yeah, Joe's, Joe's situation is absolutely horrible and he doesn't necessarily deserve to be there for as long as he has been. Um, but it has not been easy here either. But, you know, I'm staying strong. I have a good support system and it's it's all working out in the end. Now, talk to me um, because that's that's really, you know, I mean, in my in my research of of trying to, to, to you know, prep for this um, it's, it's really to, to try to understand, you know, more about you, because I think it's, uh, you know, everyone. Joe at this point is a celebrity. We all know about him. Um, we all know that story. But. You know, it's true. I don't think enough people talk about the fact that you're 24. You have a lot of eyes on you very quickly in the past couple months, really. Um, yeah. How do you these days kind of, you know, find mm -hmm. that common, like uh, some some kind of comfort in your life and some kind of like, you know, just relaxation, get away from from everything going on? So I have like the same group of friends that I have had since before I met Joe to when I met Joe, to after Joe was arrested, to now. So they've kind of been my constant and my rock. And, you know, it's it's good to have a, a strong support system like that for people who aren't going to judge you no matter what. Um, so they've really been the people keeping me sane while all this is happening. And so talk to me about, uh, you know, before it got released, what did you expect the reaction would be? Did you think people would, I mean, you know, did you think people would start, messaging you on social media or following you or emailing you? I mean, what did you kind of expect from it? No. So like before the show dropped, you know, nobody really expected it to be as big as it is. I, I did think people would speak their mind and there would be judgment, good and bad. Um, but, you know, to the extent of what it is, never would I have thought that it would, it would be here at this point. And how is it, you know, now, I mean, based on the show, you can kind of tell that Joe Joe likes that attention. You know, he likes uh, people loving him and and talking to him and looking up to him like that. For you, are you like that as well? I mean, do you like this attention? Is it something that you wish almost there's like a you know a point of diminishing return that you don't really like everything that that's been happening? How do you feel about it? Um, you know, I never really cared for the limelight or or any for my life to be kind of put out there. Um, but, you know, Joe, on the other hand, did. Um, so, I mean, there is going to be some, like, big opportunities that are happening for Joe and I. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But it's nothing that I ever wanted, and I'm just kind of rolling with it as it goes. And I know that uh, – so you're right now you're a bartender. That's correct? Yeah. And, I mean, obviously with everything going on, you probably can't yeah. work. But uh, were you able – like – what the, 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 the documentary released right when this all started. So were you ever working while this had released or no? No, I was not. So, you know, thankfully I only got my two minutes of screen time anyway, and I look completely different than what I did in the docu-series. So I feel like even if I would have still been working, it would still be kind of on the, the, the lay low, because only like my close friends really know, you know. And I mean, I've been recognized a few times out outside but not not very often so i'm also thankful for the quarantine for that <laughs> what's it what what in the few interactions that you've had of being recognized what's that been like for you so i've been at the it's so awkward um you know i'm just like a normal dude it's just you know people are just interested in what i'm doing um but it's like people are like oh my god like is it okay if i get a picture with you and i'm like yeah like a cop asked me to get a picture i was like only if you don't give me a ticket um <laughs> I mean, what are your uh immediate plans assuming quarantine ends and you can and people can kind of go back to normal do you still intend to to bartend or do you have other i know there's obviously a lot of, a lot of other things opportunities going on but um you know do you expect to kind of go back to to some normalcy you know i mean bartending is always going to be something that i really like to do 
Um, it's a lot of fun. You, you get to meet a lot of cool new people. And like, especially after this, if I were to go back, people would want to come in more. But I mean, I do have other things lined up that I will be doing. I'm not going to talk too much on that, but there are some things that are going to be happening. So then, you know, once I get a break from that, I'm definitely going to, I have places where I can still go back and bartend. And when you, I just, I just want to bring you back, uh, cause I don't know if that many people know about, you know, your childhood and your upbringing. I mean, will you tell us a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and what you were like as a kid? I mean, I, I could imagine even just three or four years ago, you probably didn't imagine life would be like it is today. Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, I was in a military family. My dad was in the Marine Corps. Um, so we lived in Colleen, Texas, um, on base for like, till I was from when I was born to when I was like six, maybe seven. And then moved to a little town called Salado. And then my parents split up when I was nine. And then my dad moved to Austin. My mom moved to another town called Belton. And so I was there in Belton from when I was 10 to 14, maybe. And then when I was 14, I went to live with my dad in Austin. And from 14 to 16, I lived with him. Um, told him I was gay, he sent me back to live with my mom, which was perfectly cool with me. Didn't even care about the dude. It was, it was perfectly fine. And um, my stepdad was like super, super supportive. He didn't care if I was gay. My mom didn't care. None of my family cared. So, you know, then I finished high school in Belton and then moved to East Texas and went to school and studied psychology and criminal justice and did college cheerleading and met a lot of really good people there. And um, that was a good like family away from home. It's kind of like a fraternity sorority mixed into one. Um, and then after I finished school, I moved to Oklahoma, met Joe and you know the story from there. And did you, uh, I mean, say before you met Joe, what, what did you expect or hope that life would look like, you know, at this point, 24, 25 and, and onwards? Honestly, I had, I have no idea at this point, just because it's been so overwhelming since I've met Joe, since the, the day I met Joe, it's been a crazy freaking ride. Um, and my situation kind of has changed every single time that something happens. So, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful to be where I am. And Without Joe, I honestly have no idea where I would be. And talk about your, I mean, you know, there's, you've done a, a bunch of press and, and I don't want to bore you with the same questions, but I, I think it's also uh, good to reiterate, um, you know, because I think there's some parts in the documentary where they want to paint Joe as X or Y um, and how he, in his re past relationships with other, with other people. But talk about what it's really like when those cameras are off, um, you know, just you and Joe as two people living together with no cameras around. Joe was a big old mushy baby. Okay. Like, like a big old tit bag, love him to death, but big old tit bag um, in front of the cameras. That's what everyone knows as Joe exotic behind the cameras is completely different person, still very sincere and very opinionated. Um, but there's like a lot of things that people don't know about Joe's life and his childhood that have really kind of shaped who he is. Um, and behind closed doors, he's not afraid to be that person. But in front of the camera, he just has to put on this persona of being this tough gay guy. You know, he has things to prove. He's a gay man living in Oklahoma, has ran for elections. Uh, more, more, I wanna also know kind of what your conversations are like. And when you talk about, uh, you know, him telling you about your, your his childhood i don't know if you want to share things that, that he's told you that people shouldn't know no not really okay I mean, he's writing a book so okay. his child and all that is going to be released into that so it's going to be a lot very intense very intense and how did your childhood um if at all and and your experiences uh you know you talk about your 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 dad not being accepting of 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 you being gay um how does that you know now that you're 24 and you've had some perspective, if you have advice for other kids who have been in similar situations, um, you know, now that you have this platform, uh, what is some advice for, for those kids that are perhaps struggling? You were the first person who's asked that, so thank you. Um, but I think there's a peacock going off back there, not gonna lie. <laughs> there's so, it's just freaking crazy here. All right, but um, you know, if, if, if you're 
gay and you're scared to come out or if one of your family members is not accepting, then their their opinion really is almost irrelevant. I mean, they may be a very important person to you at the time, but and they may come around eventually. But, you know, there are people who are going to love you no matter what, and they will support you and root for you even in your worst and darkest times, which was has been my situation. I can't speak for absolutely everything in everybody's circumstances, but you know, you just gotta keep your head up and know that it's only temporary when you're not gonna be accepted. Um, and it may hurt at the time, but in a week, a month, a year, however long, you, you're gonna have people who are gonna wanna be there for you and take care of you and, and love you no matter what you're going through or who you are. And I think what's also beautiful about uh, you even talking about that and also in other interviews that I've heard you talk about uh, how when you met Joe, you were in this really dark place, right? And you've talked about uh, dealing with substance abuse and, and things like that. I don't know how much you do or don't want to get into that, but I do think, um, you know, a lot of people can probably relate to a lot of those different, um, you know, issues on a lot of different levels. Do you want to maybe talk about... Uh, <laughs> What was that? Was there a rock bottom that you felt like uh, in your life that, you know, maybe was a, as a moment that you realized I got to make a change? Because I think now that you do also have this platform, you know, there's a lot of people that are that feel lost. And maybe it's because they, they don't feel loved. They don't feel accepted. And they turn to, to substances for for a variety of reasons. For you, do you feel like you turning to those substances was anything in relation to not being accepted by by someone like your dad or was it completely separate? No, so my substance abuse problem was completely separate than that. Like my my dad's perspective on my life is really does not shape who I am whatsoever. And, you know, he's honest to God, quite irrelevant to me. And I really, he, I have no relationship, relationship with him. Don't care to, don't want to, don't think I ever will in my future. Um, but mine was more about, was, had to do with a depression of, you know, being cheated on constantly being in a really toxic relationship. And that's what kind of drove me to, to start taking Xanax. And I was taking it so much so I would forget how I was feeling. So I wouldn't feel anything at all. And then, so I'd feel numb and then I'd forget the entire day behind me, you know, that I had gone through already, which was why I stuck with it, you know? And it, that's one of the things that made it so addicting to me is that I was just numb and I didn't have to feel anything when I was off of it. All of the emotions came flooding in. So I was at rock bottom for quite a while. Um, and then when I met Joe, he literally put the situation in front of me and was like, you have no choice but to be sober so you can keep these animals alive. And so that gave me a purpose and made me feel like my life was worth something that these animals were depending on me. Um, and so being in that kind of state of mind really brought me out of my darkest time. And, you know, I can't be any more grateful for the things Joe has done for me and, and helped me and making me realize that there is more to me than just forgetting a certain period of time. That period of time shaped who I am. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. And and for you, when did you uh so when did you what was that period of time that you you were abusing? Like when did you first start and when did that I mean you kind of ended at what 21 or so? No, so I started at 21. Okay. Um probably around January, February of 2017 and it wasn't really bad until maybe like April, May okay. of 2017 and then um I that maybe lasted like three or four months. And then like in August, September, I was back home living with my sister and I was like, you know what? Like, I can't do this anymore. And so like, I went through a super dark place. And then I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to, I went to my cousin in Oklahoma and, and then it got really bad again for like a solid month. And then I met Joe. And then that's when I was like, okay, no more done with, I don't need it. I have other things I need to focus on. There's, there's, I have goals now and you know, there's people who are going to do everything to keep me away from that. And that was the most important thing to me. It's like just the people around you are really the, the ones who impact your decision-making. And did you make that, was it, were you able, I mean, some people are able to, to go from, you know, 
substance to zero. Some need to do a gradual change. What kind of, was that an easy process for you? I mean, it was definitely difficult. Um, it was a gradual process for sure, because I went from having full access to, to getting the, the drugs um, when, when I was in college and still around there in that summer period. Um, and then, you know, when I went home, it was not able for me to get it, which was also very frustrating at the time. Um, and then when I moved to Oklahoma, I thought I was going to be getting away from it. And, but then I was just like put right in the middle of the same situation. So it had easily accessible substances for me to get. Um, so then the first couple of weeks of me being at the zoo, when I just quit cold turkey, were the most miserable weeks of my life. I was so sick, couldn't really function almost like it was just so minimal. Um, so I had a lot of help from Joe and, and getting me out of bed and like just keeping me feeling right, you know, and, and manageable. And for, it was just, it was really bad at first, but you know, after the first couple of weeks, two, three, then, excuse me, then I was like, okay, this is this is manageable this is manageable so for a couple months afterwards you know there were obviously urges for me to to want to go back there um but i was like no like i don't need to i don't need to want to do that i don't make good choices so and so what were those uh, what were those conversations like when with joe when he's uh you know just trying to to get you out of bed as you say or or to kind of get you away from that. I mean, cause that's stuff that I don't even think we, we ever really see at all in the documentary. Um, and, and, you know, people, and people want to portray him as, as you know, whatever they want to portray him as, but it's those moments that you realize, um, you know, those are the most meaningful moments in life in reality. Um, but what are those conversations Joe, like? Joe was, every conversation was like tough love. Um, you know, he kind of was like, okay, you're either going to do this, or you're going to do this. It wasn't, there was no black and white about it. I mean, there was no like color in between. It was just black or white. You do this, you do this. And, um, you know, he was an asshole while still being very caring and, you know, considerate of the, my, the place I was in. So it was like uplifting, but like, he wasn't degrading me. He was just like, well, making me realize like, well, this is what's going to happen if you decide to go back to that. Gotcha. And what's the, what would you say is the biggest min misconception about Joe? <laughs> that he's a big old asshole. I mean, he, he can definitely be an asshole, but he has like the sweetest side and it's just very frustrating. He hasn't been able to defend himself and it's really been just me. And obviously I'm his husband, so I'm going to want to defend him. But it's like, you, nobody knows Joe unless you're behind that front door. Mm. No. And I'm not saying he's a perfect person because he's not. He's definitely made some pretty bad decisions, but he's also made some really good choices and helped a lot of people, which has gone unnoticed. And for you, I mean, you know, people, there's the memes, there's everyone's going to gonna make jokes about everything. But but the reality is, is uh, for you, I can imagine it's it's really hard. I mean, your, your husband's in jail, you know, like that's people can joke about everything. But at the end, end of the day, there's, there's real life consequences to all this. How do you yeah. um, and you're young? Um, how do you you know, I mean, you talk about that, that foundation, and the support team that's behind you. But on a daily basis, um, you know, how do you cope with these things when when those people are not around? Um, how do you continue life and, and keep a positive mindset? while also knowing that your loved one is in is in prison because the reality is a lot of people even if they're not dating a, a Joe exotic who's a celebrity at this point um, but a lot of people have their spouses in prison and it's very hard for them and their families how do you are there any other you know recommendations that you have for people that ha are si in similar positions you know initially it was extremely hard um, because then I was just completely independent um, I hadn't been independent since I'd been sober um so it was it was it was really hard at first but you know it, it's hard to say this but like it gets kind of normal to at one point it's like this is just the way it is and you can't do anything but be hopeful for the best um so even when i don't have my friends around me i still know like hey this this could be the outcome so staying optimistic in the most negative cir circumstance is the best way to go about this kind of situation and are there other things um are there any activities that you like to do or, or small things that, you know, can take your mind off of everything going on? 
So, I mean, I love music festivals. I go to them as many times as I possibly can. And I have like my whole little rave group and it's just super cool. But when I'm not at music festivals, I'm with my friends playing pool or just like hanging out downtown or going to the beach, you know, and just recently started playing beach volleyball. And that shit's a lot of fun. Sand burn is no joke, let me tell you. And jumping in sand is even harder, but it is, it, it, it's a lot of fun. So, I mean, I just, I have little activities that, that kind of keep me focused, I guess. Do you feel like you're still able to have, uh, you know, the normal or somewhat of a normal 24 year old life? You know, do you feel like part of you, because part of you is with Joe in a sense, um, that it almost limits your ability to, to live life as in your 20s? No, so before the documentary, very normal life, living like a normal 24 year old. After the documentary dropped, it's it was just like, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to live a normal life again, just because of how insane the whole world situation is. And do you, does that scare you? A little bit, I would be lying if I, if I said no, anybody kind of would. Um, your life gets put on blast completely. There's probably, you know, so many people Googling me right now. And it's just like, leave me the hell alone. Like, <laughs> like I'm just a normal dude. But at this point, I feel like I can't really say that anymore. Is there part, now, of, is there part of you that uh, regrets being part of the documentary or regrets being part of this story? Like not obviously Joe, but just being, you know, under this spotlight? No, I have, I have no regrets in my life. No regrets. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I don't regret any decision I've ever made because it's shaped the person I am now. And I feel like I've been a different person growing wise um, since the day I met Joe. And since even before, everything is a new situation and it's a new direction for me to go. And I just kind of go with it, learn from it, and try to make my decisions and base them off of my previous actions. And do you ever get bothered by, uh, you know, some people are just going to know you as Dylan Passage, Joe Exotic's husband. I think people need to also realize you're, you're your own person too, you know. You, like, Joe Exotic is Joe Exotic, but you're your own person. How do you, uh, does, that, does that, one, bother you? And two, do you uh, ever try to, you know, be like, hey, you know, I, I have assets that I can bring to, to something. I'm not just this person's husband. Yeah. So those questions like for sure go hand in hand. Um, so I, I'm just going to take the situation as it is. And, you know, I'm going to really absorb these opportunities that are, you know, coming to light and um, these opportunities that are just like, I'm going to be able to be a part of. Um, and that's what I'm going to use to make people see me as Dylan Passage, not Joe Exotic's husband. And don't get me wrong, I love Joe, um, but that's not how I want to be known for the rest of my life because I am an individual. I'm not just this person's side piece, if that makes sense. Right. You know, like I, I don't just stand next to them. I am this person and they are this person and we coexist. Now, I want to ask you more about um, how often do you are you able to, to talk to Joe these days? Since he's been moved to Fort Worth, I've only been able to talk to him like four times, four or five times. So it's been kind of hard. But in Oklahoma, I was talking to him constantly all day. And what's, uh, I mean, especially for, for a personality like that, I can imagine it's really hard to be uh, locked up. I mean, what's his mental state? If you could give us just, a, just an insight on how he's, how he's doing, just, you know. This is, this is Joe's mental state. It's up and down, up and down. I mean, it's super difficult to be where he is, especially where he is now in Fort Worth because he can't have phone access and he's constantly by himself because of the virus. Um, so he, he needs to be able to talk to people to stay sane or since they're not next to him. So, you know, he's definitely having a hard time, but he's holding up and staying optimistic and trying to take what these lawyers are saying to him and just wait it out because they have big plans. Does he have any, uh, any somewhat maybe good stories from jail or people that he's met that have uh, that have inspired him or or something that that's notable that maybe the world doesn't know about his time there i mean a lot of people that he was in there with are like previous doctors and lawyers and and cops you know so he's he's learned a lot about the legal system while being in there and he is going to use all of that to his advantage and 
um, he made friends with all these people from in jail. Like he has friends that are in prison. He would, you know, this thing, even when he was out of jail, when he was a free man, he, every year he did the Thanksgiving dinner. He did that every Thanksgiving he's been in jail and he did made Thanksgiving dinner as best as he could, obviously being in jail for all of the people on his block and like his cellmates. So, I mean, he's, he, he's still Joe. He's not completely broken, but he's a little broken. Do you, do you think he's okay? Like, do you, do you worry about him? Um, sometimes he's not okay. And then sometimes he is okay. I really just don't know how it's going to go each day. Um, just try to keep him positive. It's really hard to say you're okay in jail because obviously it's right. fucking jail. So, um, he's holding up. That's uh, like, as best as I can describe it. And in terms of, uh, I mean, not you, there's probably some things you can't go into, but you know, what's the behind the scenes with lawyers and, and appeals. And I can imagine, you know, trying to reduce sentences here and there and, and people have, you know, literally started campaigns to try to get a presidential pardon. I mean, what, are there any things that you can say that are on the table that they're trying to work out? All I'm going to say is that he has a team of eight attorneys, eight of the best attorneys in Texas who are working to help him and a very intelligent and strong PI who is investigating absolutely everything for this team of attorneys. So he has got a lot of good people behind his back right now and it's going to it's going to work in his favor for sure. And you're so you guys are the whole like exotic team is feeling hopeful of what's what's next. Oh yeah, for sure. Are there any big dates or big like timelines that uh like you're you guys can't tell you can't tell me <laughs> okay that's okay that's okay and um so but overall he you know he's staying in there but he's he has a hopeful mentality yeah definitely after being involved with this team exotic <laughs> and does he uh does he ever talk about plans of when he's out or things that you know uh, uh, like of the things you can talk about. Does he does he hope to go back into the big cat world? Is he done with that? What does he ever he talk wants, about that? He he's kind of done with the animal world if, in the public eye, but he still wants his animals, his personal animals, um, and just have his own little private zoo. And you know that's one of his goals. And the other is just to fix his reputation because people have torn it to pieces, and he wasn't able to defend himself. So. He's gonna, he has a big mouth, so he's going to be running that damn thing when he gets out. Yeah, and I mean, that's the, that's the biggest part is I think he, you know, he's probably the most anticipated uh, person to, once he comes out, he's going to be a global phenomenon, you know? Be ready. <laughs> be ready. <laughs> <laughs> Does he, I mean, the thing that I also think about is, you know, as you say, running his mouth must have got him a lot of great things that also probably got him into a lot of trouble Put his ass in jail too. Yeah. <laughs> so does, do, do you think that, uh, you know, that double-edged sword, is that ever something you talk about of maybe like being like, Hey, you know, let's, let's slow this down a little bit. I want to see every you. Time. It's been, yeah. Every single time we talk on the phone because he says way too much than he should on a recorded freaking line. And, uh, <laughs> and that's, that was his main problem. when even during his trial, it was like, he was trying to defend himself, but like that's why you got the attorneys down there. You just answer the questions, and that's it. And then he's like, "Oh, let me go into this and this and this." And just kind of dug himself into a hole while providing more information that was then not able to be used in the case. And I mean, does he? Uh, I know. I think in another interview, I, I heard you talk about he for a while. He had access to the emails. Did he ever get to watch the documentary? By the way, he has not seen the documentary. No. And how did you describe it to him? You know, he just, the only thing I really say to him is that you're fucking famous. Everyone knows who you are. Um, he, he has seen memes, though. Guards have shown him memes, and he thinks they're freaking hilarious. Which one's his favorite? Has he told you about any that he likes? Um, Carol Baskin God, ones? He, he really likes so much, but, but my favorite one was the, this is, he's like holding two guns, and he's got the two tigers on next to him, and it's like, this is the genie that appears when you rub a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> he loves all the Carol ones. Like, the guards have shown him, like, the Carol Baskin killed her husband. Wow. <laughs> Love the guards, dude. And uh, does, he, does he still have uh, that same animosity towards Carol and, and those that whole squad, or is, is that kind of done now? 
No, I mean, obviously he's not happy with them and he doesn't want them to be free. And he knows that now that after the show dropped, they're all going to be where he is. It's, they're going to switch spots. Like, have you seen that show, Swap, like Wife Swap? That's what it's going to be. <laughs> is he, uh, well, yeah, you can't talk about that. There's there's so many things that you want, you want to ask. But um, so overall, I mean, would you say that, uh, you know, compare life before documentary and now and just have you had a second to take it all in like do you ever just sit there and you're like holy fuck what is going on no i had that i've I've not had that moment yet i have not every day there's like i have like a like a set schedule for how i'm supposed to do things and like this this week has been pretty relaxed compared to past weeks over the past month and a half two months and um, but no, I haven't really had the, the chance to just sit down and be like, let it all like just sink in and realize, you know, it's just kind of still, I'm just Dylan. That's all I care to be like, be cool with that. And if you have one, but I am putting a cannabis still. I'm excited about that. Really? Can you tell us anything more about that or no? Um, that's all. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Free week for life. Free week. Wow. Um, and what? You know, other than a lot of we've talked about a, a few different subjects with with coming out and and using this platform to, to inspire other people. Are there any other messages that, you know, you feel passionate about that you might continue to speak about that, uh, you know, now that you have this platform, you hope to, to inspire other people? Because, you know, you're not just Joe Exotic's husband. You're someone who's gone through a lot of things in your life, in your young life. You still have a lot of life ahead of you. Um, but is there any message that that you hope to, to convey to younger people out there that are struggling in, in different variety of ways. Shit might get hard right now, but it's not always going to be like that there. You are going to move past it. It may seem super intense at the moment, but it's not forever. Um, obviously things may follow you forever, but that's not going to, you know, sh- that negative stuff is not going to shape exactly who you are. It's going to help you build yourself to be who you are. Hmm. Beautiful. And do you uh, do you ever think about the first thing that you and Joe are gonna do once he's freed? We're going to the fucking beach somewhere else. Yeah, we're getting out of here. And if I tell you, uh, Dylan, what do you hope life looks like in ten? No, let's go five, ten, and twenty years down the line. What do you say? Um, I want my animals, a nice house on the beach. And I just want to be happy. That's it. I just want to not have a, a worry in the world. And I'm on that track, let me tell you. Beautiful. Uh, everyone can fo- follow you on Instagram at uh, D- it's Dillert, D I L L E R T underscore L C L M. That's correct? Yep. Beautiful. Um, Dylan, an absolute pleasure to, to have you on my show. Uh, yes. Yeah having me man it's uh you know first of all i mean you know i can't even imagine all the things that you're going through from from the press from just even your personal life so to see you with this positive attitude and uh just being able and willing to to talk to people and inspire people is is beautiful to see and i wish you and and joe nothing but the best um you know we hope that for you guys it, it all works out um and in do in good short time so uh sending you all my best and uh thank you so much for taking the time man no, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And, you know, glad I could could speak my mind and, you know, possibly help people out.